Hello my darling, a new books video and apparently it's spring. It's March the 1st and it's spring. Anyway, let's get started first with physical books. As you may be aware of, I'm reading a lot of physics related books because of the book that I'm trying to write, which is Jules. And since I know nothing of physics or math or anything of the lot, I've had to gain a certain knowledge of the matter. Alongside it, I found out philosophy isn't always useless. So here are two books that actually surprised me. This is How to Think Like a Bat and 34 are the really interesting uses of philosophy. You can read it in one go, really, because the chapters are funny, like how to be a god, how not to eat people, and how to love what does not exist. It's consoling, it's ironic, it's funny and it's a... I think it's a... It's thought-provoking, a kickstarter to huge questions and probably a laugh is the only way you can actually tackle such huge issues. This is more uh, specific probably. It's the Philosopher's Toolkit and it is what it says, a compendium of philosophical concepts and methods. Like let's discuss the existence of God, what is bad faith and what is morality. And then Amazon really kindly suggested the first and second book of General Ignorance, this is obviously coming from the BBC4 and then BBC1 QE programme, and since Stephen Fry is involved, I mean, oh, and I won't talk much about it. The point is, it's not just uh, a random list of facts you can amaze your friends with, it's a celebration of curiosity. What actually triggers wondering and pondering about these books is not the questions that are answered here, but the ones you still have to ask. Now, the last physical book, where is it? Oh, here it is. Suggestion on Fawn Spring, once again. It's the first of the Hunger Games series, and I have to say, if we have to stick to a genre like young adults fiction, this, to me, was the best of the lot. I read it all in one take, because it's compelling. It takes you in a dystopian world where everything is clearly explained, it takes you there, it's perfectly understandable. The themes are not so young adulty, and the fact that this is being turned into a movie, or maybe already turned into a movie, got me extremely worried, first, because I don't really like the uh, main girl, and second, because some of the themes and scenes, as I said, are quite raw and rough. So yes, it is a younger literature, maybe, but that doesn't make it easy or light, and certainly it doesn't make it shallow. The good thing is that we have a main girl here, and she's nothing like Bella Swan. And I've loved her for this. I'm waiting for the others, uh, two books of the series, and I'm really curious. It is a quick read, it's not necessarily a light read, but it's quick because you won't be able to put it down. The reason why I was so skeptic is that between two praises, um, they chose to put the Stephanie Mayers in the front and Stephen King's in the back. So I thought, what does this tell me about you? But I was wrong. This was trying to get noticed and it's worth noticing it. The first ebook that I have to talk about feels like I'm talking of one of my own. <laughs> well, because it's John Green it's, and probably his media house is on YouTube, so The Fault in Our Stars. Everyone was praising it and I couldn't wait to do my part. Let me praise it, because The Fault in Our Stars is a beautiful, beautiful, hard story. It tells the story of a 16 years old cancer patient named Hazel who is forced by her parents to attend a support group. Fox 2000 has already acquired film rights. It's a story of life and death and of illness, of hope, uh, have I mentioned love? Since we're at it, also about heroes and whether it's preferable to have them help you at a distance or see what they can do for you once you meet them. It's amazingly written. The quota of tears and laughter are probably even. Like, there are bits where you actually burst out laughing and bits where you actually burst out crying. Since I've tested it with the movie reviews, I'm now going to black and white for a bit of spoilers. One may say the fact that Augustus dies is easy to anticipate, but I have to say it didn't spoil the story for me. It's like an Edgar Allan Poe's pendulum, really, hanging over you, threatening, 
So you're torn between, no, 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 please not yet, or let, let's just get it over with. Okay, done. I didn't think the choice of talking about cancer was demagogic in any way. This is someone with an amazing brain, a huge talent for writing, who chooses to talk about something that we normally try to ignore. And this I personally find extremely brave. I didn't know this until uh, John's second to last video. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children was written by one of his college pals. And this makes me wonder who were their teachers? Because if they all turned out like this, they all have to get to writing. Miss Peregrine's actually follows roughly similar lines to the 14 hour stars. The idea is of a 16 year old with an illness of his own who has to confront what he has left of his hero. In his case, we're talking about his granddad. In both books we have a journey and both journeys are epiphanies and revelations. Miss Peregrine's actually takes you to a whole different world. And as with the 14 hour stars, your own world won't look exactly the same after you're done with these books. Miss Peregrine's tells you of a magical world and makes you understand a little bit more about the one you live in. The fact that you have a 16 year old doing all the talking is so rough and honest. Probably it's just because he's not diplomatic yet. So these characters, to me, they're not looking for a hard-on, abrasive honesty. They just can't help it. And this is extremely fascinating to me. When heroes in the 14 hour stars were put to a test just by meeting them, the problem of the hero of the granddad in Miss Peregrine's is the listener of his stories is just growing up. And so he's questioning these amazing stories. So I think in the end they come to the same conclusion. The importance of heroes is actually the space they occupy in your heart, which is extremely blatant and obvious when I say it like this, but obviously you can't doubt these two put it very differently. I think I had already spoken about Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, but I thought I might do it again because of the movie. I've personally liked Extremely Loud a lot, even though critics tore it apart exactly like they're doing with the movie now, and I really can't understand why. One of the main points was that um, the narrator, being a child, talks like a 30-something. And yes, he probably does, but the point is that we're dealing with an intellect that's really different from everyone else's. I find Extremely Loud so intimate, so delicate. I think it's dealing with the grief of 9-11 very politely. And this is what got me worried at first when the movie came out, because it's so full, again, of very intimate details. I was afraid it might just be thrown into the mainstream, you know, with a movie that has Sandra Bullock and Tom Hanks in the roadster. I was a bit worried, but in the end, I think the book and the movie go along the same track, but in a different way, so they don't spoil each other. To me, Extremely Loud is one of those books that I don't question. I don't care whether it's realistic or a kid could actually think like that. The point is it triggers so many thoughts and emotions, it's priceless to me. I had a lot of other books to talk about, but I'm gonna cut it short. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is The Midnight Palace by Zafon, the one we all know and love. Uh, the Midnight Palace is one of those books that, again, go under the label of young adults literature. And I've always enjoyed Zafon in this different way of telling stories. I think the main element that makes this magical is that uh, Zafon has a peculiar talent to build memories. And to me, it's not too much about the story he tells, but again, the memories he gives you through his characters so that you actually find yourself nostalgic and missing people you have never met. Maybe The Midnight Palace is not as flawless as other exercises of the same kind. I'm thinking about The Light of September. There are bits that are a bit dragged along, in my personal opinion. But still, it's one of those books that I felt sorry I'd finished. Because it's so paint-like, the way he describes places, you really want to go back there. 
the ability of giving you so many details but still lets you free to imagine things the way you want to is really, really magical about him. Maybe if I have to say another defect, there are a lot of characters and maybe they're introduced in a slightly schematic way but in the end they all make sense and they're all there for a purpose. Some bits are a bit raw here as well but as with the Hunger Games it's one of those tales that's not afraid to make youngsters afraid and when it's not gratuitous I always find it a good thing. They should know fear, they should know how to deal with it. Again, my own personal opinion. Now, links in the box this time are even more useful than usual because you can find a short story by Neil Gaiman, it's called A Study in Emerald. Again, it's a short story, at first I feared it was a fan fiction. But anyway, where Sherlock Holmes and Lovecraft meet and clash. By the way, Neil Gaiman apparently is writing a new book right now, but he's on Twitter and Tumblr a lot if you want to follow him as much as I do. You can't miss worldbookday.com, again, link in the box. A link to the London Book Fair, which I'm probably going to attend. A link to an archive of Sherlock Holmes. If I'm not mistaken, it's just the novels and not the short stories, but still, it's free. From Reader's Bench, I got to know the Huffington Post com slash books. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And then I have to talk very briefly about William Joyce. Now William Joyce is not only blessed by such a surname, which is kind of precious if you want to be a writer, he is also involved with Pixar and DreamWorks alike for Toy Story, Bugs Life, now he is taking care of The Rise of the Guardians for DreamWorks again. But most of all, he is the co-founder of the Moonbot Studios, aka the Museum of Future Children's Classics. He is the mind and the heart behind the fantastic flying books of Mr. Maurice Lesmore that won the Oscar last night. You can find it for download, both iPhone and iPad, I think. Flying Books is 3 dollars I think it's Euros. And the younger brother, it's numberless, it's 4 dollars And also there's the official site, again, down in the doobly-doo, to follow the ongoing projects of this amazing imagination. I'm really proud of myself. Not only have I not been blinded by the sun, but I've kept it really short. So, as usual, thank you for all the suggestions that I received. This is the greatest gift you could give me a book. I hope I've done my bit and maybe given you a couple of reading suggestions. Let me know what you think about the books I've talked to you about, especially if you've already read them, if you intend to read them. As usual, I hope I've not bored you to death and I hope you'll be willing to hear me blabber about books again in the next one. Bye! <laughs>